Assalamu alaikum. Um, I'm glad and thrilled to be here. I'm uh, waiting to hear from you more than I, what I give. This is a very uh, hot topic in the uh, era of changing in management in ophthalmology, and it's definitely growing up very fast with significant amount of um, competition and speed in development. From the moment you wake up in the morning till the minute you close your eyes, there is a hidden soldier in your eye working dynamically to make, you to make sure you are visualizing everything at a great amount of focus. As you drive, or when you breastfeed your child for mothers, or when you cuddle your child, you might not even notice that you cannot see very well until you blow your 40th candle. It was Schneiner in 1619 who first described the inability of the eye to focus at two images simultaneously. He tried to put a card with double pinholes and was able to see that one eye could see only one image at a time. If you bring another image in front of it, the other image would be blurred, just like what we see in the old um, movies, how they focus on one object and blur the other object. He named this accommodation. Accommodation is a dynamic optical change in the diopteric power of the eye, depending on what you're focusing at. So what triggers accommodation? The first thing that triggers accommodation is the blurred vision. When you look at a book or try to read, immediately your eye will change the focus of accommodation according to what your interest of sight is. When your child calls you and you lift your glaze up and look at your child, in less than a fraction of a second, your eye can focus on your child that is coming towards you or look to the TV uh, in front of you. I can do this in the clinic by putting a negative lens in front of the eye to blur the image. Or I can increase the vergence of the eye by putting a base out prism to push the image away and force the eye to converge and find the proper focused image. Or I can do this pharmacologically using a parasympathomimetic like pilocarpin. When accommodation is triggered, a near refle reflex starts. The near reflex has convergence, that is when you put two axial visual axes at one site. It has the amount of meiosis, that's when your pupil constricts, and the lens accommodation. If you look carefully at this child trying to see the tip of his nose, you will notice how the pupils constrict when he exactly sees the tip of his nose. This video demonstrates what I will say. First, as an object approaches, can you lift the, the volume? Bracket in a process called convergence. The size of the eyes in this example has been greatly exaggerated so that the subtle movement that takes place during convergence can be seen. Convergence of the eyes keeps the image of the object of interest centered on the fovea, the part of the retina where resolution is highest. If the eyes do not converge appropriately, diplopia, or double vision, occurs. Second, the pupil must constrict to restrict the entry of light rays diverging from a near object, since diverging rays cannot be bent enough by the periphery of the lens to make them fall on the fovea. If the pupil were to remain dilated, the image would be blurred. Finally, the shape of the lens must change, increasing its refractive index so that the light rays passing through it converge on the fovea. In distance vision, the lens is pulled at its equator by the suspensory ligament, so that it is relatively thin. When the muscles of the ciliary body contract, the tension on the suspensory ligament decreases, and this allows the lens to assume a rounder shape, increasing its power to bend light. As a result, the image is focused on the fovea. Combined convergence, pupillary constriction, and rounding up of the lens all function to keep an object in focus as it approaches. So this video illustrates what I want to say in just a few seconds. To put, our, to put things online, what is, are the possible responsible parts in your eye for accommodation? Is it the cornea? Is it the lens and its capsule? Is it the ciliary body or the vitreous? Too many postulations and hypotheses have been trying to understand it, but eventually, at the end of the bottom of the line, they all work as one system. There are optical requirements for accommodation. You need the lens to push in and out, you need to change the depth of focus, and you need to have good visual acuity to have good accommodation. 
When this changes in accommodation, what actually happens is when the light diverges from a distant infinity, it hits the cornea and the lens and it focuses on the focal point. But if a near object is brought by, then what happens to the lens? It changes its configuration into a more spherical uh, shape and focusing near objects. As we are children, and when you look at your child, they bring up close their objects and their toys and their books very near to the, to the sometimes to the point we tell them, please put your book far away or put your iPad far away from you. That's because they have very high amplitude of accommodation. But when we grow up, we intentionally push our books away from us. This is called the amplitude of accommodation, which reduces with our age. How can I measure amplitude of accommodation? I can either do this subjectively by asking the patient where exactly is his near uh, point or blurred area is by push-up method, I, as you see here in the picture, or put a minus lens or a plus lens, as I mentioned before. Or I can do this objectively with the new technology using autorefractometer, eye trace abrometer, UBM, and Visanti OCT. The beauty about the objective method is it does not ask the patient any question. It just measures it objectively, whatever it's seeing or interpreting data from the patient's outcome data. So this objective measure has an element of false method. When you send a, a senior patient to the optometrist to, to take uh, reading glasses, sometimes the patient comes to you with only plus one, and he's already 70-something. And you will get surprised. How can a 70-year-old see clearly at with only one plus diopter? This is because it is not only the accommodation that plays a role in good near vision. We actually have something called pseudo-accommodation or other components. The pseudo-accommodation is not by any means related to the lens. It is related more to what you see in the cornea and the optics. The true accommodation is the dynamic change of the lens power. But the pseudo-accommodation is when I see an object at a variable distances nearby, I can see something clearly sharp in focus, but the two things beyond and behind still seem to be in focus. So this is the ability to focus on objects without changing the diopteric power of the lens. Like when you're driving, you don't notice that your dashboard is still clear and your um, hand wrist is still clear and your seal driving, driving far away is still clear. The true accommodation is what we target in some parts of our management, but the pseudo accommodation actually carries the higher upper hand of the new technology in treatment. This is to describe what you see as for depth of focus. The two line, this line is what you see here on the retina. And the lines above and the lines below are the depth of field. Usually, it should be that the depth of field is what you see abroad, away from you. And this is what falls on the retina. The depth of field has to be more than your depth of focus. Depth of field is this spot that can be seen clearly on the retina. The depth of focus, and that's what we will describe, I need you to pay attention here because this is what we will be talking about with all of our management. How much in this area can the retina see as clear? Even if it's a little bit behind the retina or a little bit in front of the retina, the eye can still see it blurred but clear enough to understand. What are the contributing factors to the depth of field or the pseudo accommodation? It is the corneal asphericity and lenticular asphericity, the pupil sides, uh, the, and the low-grade myopia. If you take a look at the cornea, the cornea is a very, very interesting structure. It is transparent, it is very easy to see, very easy to um, apply treatment on. It is, has a very high refractive index, and it's created in SubhanAllah in a very fantastic way that a change, a minor change in the corneal surface can significantly change your diopteric power of the eye. It is 70%, it has 70% of the optical power. The radius of curvature is 7.8, but the refractive index is very high, which means when the light rays pass from the air down to the cornea, it has to be converged inwards strongly. That's what makes it fascinating for ophthalmologists to touch and change. It's been said that if you change a little bit on the steepening of the cornea, you can change dramatically the diopteric power of the eye, and that's what we do with our refractive surgery. So when the light rays come to hit a steep corneal, uh, let's say, take a look at this shape. I intentionally did not bend this area uh, strongly because I wanted to compare to you what happens when the light hits a, a steeper part. If a light hits 
a slightly flatter corneal tip and goes into the back of the eye where a focal point is. This is the focal length that we have. But when the cornea is a little bit steeper than what's supposed to be, the focal length is a little bit shorter, which means that this is a stronger surface or it has a corneal curvature that strongly bends the light rays nearer. The steeper the surface is, the shorter the focal point is. If I need to see an object at around 10 centimeters in front of me, I will need 10 diopters of accommodation with simple optic laws. So why isn't our eye created as a perfect sphere? If this is very strong, why don't we have a perfect sphere in our eyes? I tried to illustrate this on you to see how much spherical aberration will have if your eye was a real sphere. So this is one of my kids' favorite toys, these jelly-like uh, orbies that you put for simmering. I have shined the light on it. And that's my husband holding it in his hand. And you can see if you leave it to be spherical, how much aberration you see. And once you compress it, how much focused the light would be. And this is exactly what's happening in your eye. If your eye were to be a very round, clear cut sphere, then there will be a lot of blur that your eye cannot um, uh, tolerate. And your vision cannot even overcome it. But once you have a very perfect um, lenticular shape, the vision will be much sharper and crisper and better for you. So this is what you see with spherical aberration. Now, to understand this in uh, physical ways or in geo uh, mathematical ways, when the light bends from the periphery, peripheral light rays are closer in focal point than the central rays, this is called positive spherical aberration, and this is what happens with an oblate cornea. Normal people do not have oblate cornea. We only have oblate corneas after refractive surgery, the majority of patients. But when the central light rays focus in front of the peripheral light rays, this is called negative spherical aberration, and that's what is very good for your depth of focus. The eye will understand this much better, and it will have a better, sharper image. If this patient, assume these are the three patients, looking upwards, just like this man in the mirror, this would be a prolate cornea, where the center is steeper than the periphery. This is a perfect sphere, and this is an oblate cornea, where this curvature is supposed to be steeper than, the than that one in the center. Prolate corneas give better visual uh, depth of field. The spherical aberration, then, are the total of the two refractive surfaces you have in your eye. It is the cornea and the lens. You don't speak about one of them in the eye because, naturally, one of them corrects the other. And that's what we see with refractive surgery. In other terms, if I want to speak about it for ophthalmologists, this is the very well-known figure of how to describe a corneal surface. The, this dark light, this dark blue, is the perfect sphere. The red one is the prolate cornea, and the blue one is the oblate. We give it the term Q value to make this simple for you. The Q value is zero when it's a perfect sphere. If it's positive, positive then it's an oblate cornea, and if it's negative, it's a prolate cornea. But are aberrations always bad? Let's see. Aberrations actually have an influence on the depth of focus. How is that? Studies have shown, this was done, I think, in one of the centers in the States, that while putting a little bit of spherical aberration in front of an eye, the blurred image gives the patient a better depth of focus. Now, this is difficult a little bit to understand, especially that we look for 20-20 sharp, crisp vision. But in, when it comes to reality, your eye does not really want a very sharp image. Your eye wants more image to see and understand. And this is what happens with, uh, uh, with a little bit of spherical aberration. If you look at this figure, this is an eye, <coughs> and that's the negative spherical aberration and positive spherical aberration. This is the magnitude of depth of focus. This was done in Cleveland Clinic, a study done in Cleveland Clinic. And they have shown that with a little bit of spherical aberration at plus minus six and minus 0 0.6 and with a plus 0 0.6, you actually have two diopters of increased depth of focus. Now, how can we achieve this? This is the same study that shows they have 
um, an artifactly brought an eye and tried to see the image that focuses on the retina, when you have no aberrations at all, the only field was seen was the sharp, crisp 2020 vision. And this is the line in the center. When they placed a positive spherical aberration, look at the image, the center is flat and the periphery are steeper. That's a prolate, uh, an oblate cornea. More distant vision was be able to see. That's what we see with hyperopic patients. But when they placed this uh, Mexican shape-like uh, aberration, where the center is slightly steeper than the periphery, and you have another steep zone, there was more depth of focus in the near. So what actually they did right now is they blend all three of them together to give you the perfect depth of focus. And then what happens type with accommodation? Assume you're, you, are an, you, me, and others who have not had any other previous surgery. What should happen with us when we accommodate? In this study, Nino Mia has um, done, sorry, has observed uh, 33 eyes of 33 young patients, all below 35, using the hartman shack ev uh, evaluation. Um, he noticed that there is a significant move push or towards negative spherical asphericity as a patient accommodates with within the four millimeter and the six millimeter zone. And this is the image that he po uh, posted in the article. This is the eye without, without accommodation. You can see it's all green. And this is the eye with accommodation. You can see the blue blur here. This represents the myopic shift that happens when the patient is accommodating. So when we accommodate, we do have an amount of negative spherical aberration. What about the pupil size? The more the pupil is large, the more light comes in, the more scatter you have. You actually do not need a large pupil to have an extended depth of focus. You need a small pupil. So it is inversely related to the pupil size. Just like your cameras, if you keep your cameras f-stop on large, you will only be able to see these two flowers. If you reduce it slightly, you will see what a little bit deeper. But if you make it only on f22, that is the 1.6 millimeter pupil diameter, you will be able to see a little further deep. We all know Dr. Jack Holliday and how, what he did at his backyard, trying to visualize what was seen um, with, with your pupils when they are dilated and when they are narrowed. He placed multiple stops at multiple feet behind him and put his professional camera at one stage. And he kept at the first image was taken when the f-stop was 5.6, that is like equal to four millimeter of your pupil. And all he can see was these two images out there. But when he constricted the f-stop down to 22, that is 1.6 millimeter of your pupil size, he managed to see all of these rows up to here. Which means that the pupils should be able to converge properly to have extended depth of focus. So the depth of focus or the pseudo accommodation that I'm stressing on increases when the pupil is small and increases when you have more negative spherical aberration. What about the lens? The lens is the dynamic here, dynamic part that, has, that can change. Its radius of curvature anteriorly is plus 10. It has a very high refractive index that is higher than the aqueous and higher than the vitreous, which forces the light to bend forward even further, even though its posterior surface is a negative power, but because the, eye, because the light is diffracted from a high index, refractive index to a lower refractive index, it does not diverge, it actually converges more. How can the lens do this? It's actually not the lens itself, it is actually the capsule. SubhanAllah, the capsule was created in a way to be very elastic, more like a rubber band. The, uh, the capsule itself, if you take the human's eye lens intact out of the body, the caps of a young patient, the capsule, it will force the lens to take a spherical form. Once you open the capsule and re release the material, the gelatinous material of the lens actually takes a flat shape. So the part of the eye that constricts or that forces the lens to be accommodating and spherical is not the lens material itself, it is the capsule itself that has doing the job. We have so many theories of accommodation and you will find so many publications. These are one of the famous tools that were my references for this lecture. The credit is given actually to Dr. von Helmholtz, who is a German scientist in 1855. Now, I've, I figured out by the end of this lecture, by the end of the study, that this is the smartest man on earth because he was able to find out what's going on in the human eye with very simple 
very, very simple, humble tools. Dr. von Helmholtz's theory describes that the eye is usually is supposed to be, uh, during an accommodated state, uh, the ciliary muscle is relaxed, but the lens is stretched. I will describe this in a minute. Him and others have all um, contributed to his theory, but it was Finchman, Fincham who had the idea of the lens effort or force on the lens. The other theory is 180 degree opposite to him. This is the zonular tension. It's Churning and Scatcher who has described this. The von Helmholtz theory Look at the lens, it is held to the ciliary body by zonules. We all know this. this. The ciliary body is like a belt lining the eye at the back behind the iris. This belt does not work like any other belt. This belt works like a purse, a purse string. When you pull on the string, this belt or the ciliary body forces itself and forces the apex to be pushed forward and more anteriorly facing the iris. This change in position of the ciliary body actually keeps more space for the zonules. The zonules do not have to be tense anymore. The zonules relax. And immediately, the lens capsule will take over its spherical shape, because this is how it's supposed to be naturally. When the eye is not accommodating and the ciliary muscles goes back to its normal place, the zonules are stretched back again, and it forces the lens capsule to be stretched back again. This is all happening without even you noticing what's going on and without any exhaustion to the eye. It is happening in fractions of seconds. In his theory, the lens should become spherical. And to become spherical, you do not add volume to it. What actually happens is the diameter of the lens becomes smaller, pushing it more towards the anterior and posterior surface. And for that, Chris Biopia, in his opinion, is secondary to lens rigidity and its counterforce active action towards the lens uh, capsule tension. Churning had another idea. Churning thought that the eye, no muscle in the human body, human body can work with relaxation. All muscles work with contraction. And for that, he thought that the lens zonules should be stretched when you, con when you uh, accommodate. He thought that the, he divided, actually, the zonules into three parts, anterior, equatorial, and posterior. He thinks that the equatorial zonules are there only for holding, but the anterior and posterior zonules are the ones doing the action. With the difference in the lens capsule thickness, the anterior and posterior zonules, when the eye contracts and the ciliary body, in his theory, goes backward, then there is a lot of tension applied on the lens, thereby the lens has to be squeezed at the edges, forcing the anterior and posterior part of the lens to bulge forward and posterior, giving the lens a prolate shape. In his theory, Press biopia is due to lens growth. We all know as cataract surgeons that doing a cataract for a very old patient is very difficult, especially when you do ECCE. It's a very bulky lens. The lens does grow, but is it really sufficient growth to stop the accommodation, or is it the hardening of the lens that stops the accommodation? <coughs> and this is another diagram to show how the lens is in Helmholtz theory and how it attains a prolate shaped with the Scatcher's theory. Again, and this is how it should look like in the Scatcher's theory or the zonular tension uh, theory. Another interesting um, theory was by Kloman and Fish. Now, Kloman and Fish have had, with their theory, answered so many unanswered questions with the Helmholtz theory. Kloman and Fish thought that the lens is suspended in the eye like this um, uh, bed in the uh, UC. The eye shouldn't be, the, the lens is in a dynamic movement pushed by the zonules and the vitreous. He thought that the zonules and the lens and the vitreous all work as a diaphragm, trying to push the lens forward. When the ciliary muscle contracts, there is a pressure gradient difference that happens. Posterior vitreous uh, pressure increases and the anterior chamber pressure reduces, forcing the lens to be pushed forward, and a little bit of bulge happens in the cornea in the lens shape because of this uh, pressure gradient. Now, there, based on their theory, too many IOLs have been improved and um, uh, modified. What actually happens with accommodation? Now, um, this article was published by Zong 
I think it was in 2012, they investigated changes in the eye using an ultra-long scan optical coherent tomography. It was a prospective observational case series, and they, it was for 21 uh, adults, all less than 35 years old. The eye was measured while relaxing and with six diopters of accommodation. They found that the lens thickness increased to 40 microns and the chamber depth reduced by 28 microns and the vitreous length increased. And interestingly, the axial length increased 4 microns, which means that the eye is actually getting some squeeze. They all, all of the findings were supporting the Helmholtz theory. So as a net result of accommodation, you have convergence, meiosis, and, optic and myopic shift. These all extend the depth of focus, and you have forward and posterior lens push slightly with increased spherical aberration and increased lens curvature. What happens with breast myopia? All of us were going to be breast myopic whether we liked or not. So it's a 100% population target. We will all, it starts actually from as early as 15 years old, but it will not be apparent before 40 years unless you were a hyperopic per person. The aging eye, subhanAllah, has so many changes. The cornea becomes more prolate as you age, and too many, um, too many cohort studies have been published about this. The pupil becomes more meiotic. The lens thick, uh, thickness increases and the capsule thins, and the capsule slightly loses its elasticity. The lens becomes sclerotic, and the thickness that happens is not in the nucleus as we see with accommodation, it's actually in the cortex, which is very stiff and hard to contract. The ciliary muscle, interestingly, as we age, attains a, an accommodated state. This is a cadaveric eye of 34 years, and this is a 59-year-old and an 80-year-old. Look at the ciliary muscle apex here, and here, and here. As you age, the ciliary muscle forces itself to go forward interiorly. All of them are compensating for the loss of accommodation, trying to give you more and more accommodation. We need functional vision. To, to act or to function normally. And what is functional vision? It is whatever you need to do without any aiding uh, glasses or, sp uh, or contact lenses. Now, when my clinic patients may come, we are seeing now so many patients coming and asking for help. Our population demands has changed. Our po population interest has changed. You can have young patients who are refusing to look older, and I'm one of them. I would never want to wear press biopic lens eye, eyeglasses. It's so ugly, actually, and it's, uh, it's so uh, unpleasant. You can even have an elderly lady who is now, her interest is no more cooking or going abroad. Her interest is sitting on her phone and chatting with her friends and relatives outside. And you have those who have great demands, and I hope you and me and others will be one of them that will never grow old, and we will always be active and functioning. You don't want an eyeglass in front of your eye or the, something that will hold you back from working. Vision exercise. Now, this is a very, very, very controversial topic, but I had to mention it because it was mentioned in the literature. Does it work or does it not work? This is Dr. William Bates in 1891, who was trying to help the presbyopic patients without any modality of treatment apart from ocular exercise, but his um, theory and, um, and exercises were abandoned and very long time ago. It was only until Dr. Gottlieb, who was a behavioral ophthalmologist, uh, I'm sorry, a behavioral optometrist, who was able to fascinate us with his result. In 1976, he uh, presented a simple um, letter showing his experience with his patient who was 52 years old, not wanting to wear his glasses. So what he did for him is give him, he gave him the um, vision exercises they give to children with ACA ratio or accommodation insufficiency. The exercise is simple and it's available online for most of us if you want. You have to purchase it for, for a few dollars only. All you have to do is try to converge these two images to become three images. And trust me, I tried to do this. It is not easy. It is not easy. Trying to focus these three images to become, uh, these two to become three will exert a lot of uh, power on your eyes. It's unfortunately, there are no studies for this and too many lawsuits have been um, uh, presented against them. It is simple other maneuvers is by sunning and palming, which seem to me like more of meditation and relaxation. But can it help? I don't know. 
there are no studies or controlled trials upon this, so we cannot give it to anyone. But I think we have reached to an age that we can start trying on ourselves. It might work. Spectacles, ancient, this is the ancient solution that we all know about. And the, um, everything changed when, um, uh, what was his name? Huh? I forgot his name. <laughs> Uh, Benjamin Franklin, yes, sorry, uh, Benjamin Franklin. Uh, he's the only one that has his face on a $100 uh, bill. Others, uh, other dollars have only um, amusement uh, images of the uh, Washington and the uh, whatever places there. He was the one who invented the bifocals because he was so unhappy with changing his glasses every now and then. We already have now trifocals and progressive, but still not everybody is happy. How can you do this exercise with your spectacles on? It was the invention of the contact lenses that helped a lot. Contact lenses aim in treatment either for monovision or bifocal and multifocal uh, vision. And I want to pr present to you here what happens with monovision because actually many other treatments you can base with your IOLs is based on your monovision. Monovision is basically giving each eye different depth of focus. When you have an eye for the distance and an eye for the near, you have two depths of focus. But this should not be of a big difference. Not more than 1.5 diopter difference can the eye tolerate. Why? Because you need to have functioning reading addition and functioning intermediate and functioning distant. This type of treatment depends a lot on the neuro adaptation. So not every patient is a good candidate for a mo a, a monovision therapy. There are too many options from soft to hard contact lenses. The, the commonest or the first designed were the multifocal RGPs. You can have it either as a transition or that depends on the pupil to sh push, uh, sorry, that depends on the lid to push the lens up, or you can have it as a uh, progressive uh, spherical, uh, gradual progressive. But they are not used commonly because they are bothersome. The contact lenses, this type has already been stopped because it is it depends on multifocality and it causes a lot of glare. But this kind of asphericity, my mother-in-law is using it and she's happy with it so far. So it's one of the uh, good alternatives and you can even do with this some mini monovision. This person is, could be something like my father who would never want to wear a reading glasses. And he might actually put his um, lengthening uh, procedures into his arm to push his book away from his face. Um, that's what's happening here. Is there a role for pharmacological drugs? Yes, indeed. Uh, the pharmacological treatment can help increase accommodation or increase meiosis. This is an article presented in 2012 and showing how uh, the use of four times pilocarpin 1% with 0.1% of diclofenac to reduce the inflammation and pain caused by the carpin, by pilocarpin. And they found that the patients, all of the patients in this uh, study, I think there were 40 patients, all of them tolerated the, uh, the eye drops very well. They all had 20-20 visions for distance and near of J1. It was applied on both eyes and the patients tolerated very well. No one lost distant vision. Four of them preferred reading with glasses and one stopped it because of burning sensation. Another very nice study I have, uh, I had the um, pleasure of attending at the Eskeres last year. Um, this is Dr. Uh, Abdul Qadir Al Ma'moon. He actually made another mixture of eye drops, but this time not aiming for accommodation and spasm, this time aiming for simple meiosis only, thereby reducing the pupillary size. He brought uh, 18 patients with, uh, and 18 other controls and used Carbacol 2.25% and 0.2% of brimonidine, that is alpha-gan. So one parasympathomimetic and one uh, alpha agonist, and combined them together. And uh, the net result was applying one drop per day in the early morning, and he measured the vision uh, and the pupil size by the end of the day. He found that after two, four, eight, and 10 hours, um, there the near visual acuity improved from J7 to J3, and remained steady for a minimum of four hours, then dropped up to J5 by 10 hours, which was still a reading vision for most of them. Accommodation treatment options. Now, if I want to put my treatment options on the eye, I can start with either corneal inlays, multifocal fecic IOLs, scleral expansion surgeries, multifocal IOLs, accommodating IOLs, or refill or photodestructive lens or just touch on the cornea. 
corneal-based surgeries. I can either do this by ablation or by femtosecond. And corneal ablation is the classic monovision or presbylasic, supracore or intracore. This is the presbymax surgery that is very well known by Schwind Amaris. It causes a corneal multifocality whereby you have a step here and a step here. It actually induces a central steep for the near vision and everything else is for distance vision. The beauty of this surgery is it is feasible and easy and, um, and it is reversible. So if the patient is not happy, you can always reverse it. It works this way. If this is the light focused on the fovea, this image is done in the opposite way, then this is the focal length of the distant and the intermediate and the near vision. The bothersome about this, pa of this is it is limited. Best patients are hyperopic patients or emetropic presbyope or pseudophagic uh, presbyope. It depends a lot on the pupil size, so not everybody is fit. Um, and it, uh, it's supposed to be, ha your target is not actually always 2020, it could be only 2025. The uncorrected near vision should be between J4 to J10 at 40 centimeters. So before uh, judging the, your patient, you have to know how to test your patient's visual acuity. Most of these patients actually complain of glare and halos, and they would need always sunglasses because of this glare and halos. The supracore, this is another um, uh, refractive surgery that is new in the market. It was initially only for hyperopes and myopes, and now it is for presbyopes. It is not bifocality, it is very focality, which means when the lens corneal shape is um, chiseled and resharpened, it is not, there is no step, you do not see a hump. What you see actually is gradual change in the uh, corneal surface, and this is what makes it better tolerated and with less um, halos and glare. Um, that's the difference between varifocality and multifocality, and I believe both of them are not yet here in the Saudi market. What about the femtosecond laser? The femtosecond laser, actually this is a very fascinating surgery and I was stunned by the outcome of the surgery, but unfortunately it is only limited. It is limited for those who are either a little bit hyperope or immetropic presbyope. What it does is, there is no cut in the cornea. You do not go to the surfaces of the cornea, you go deep in the corneal stroma and create multiple steps, just like this image. Actually creating multi corneal multifocality. Unfortunately, this procedure was stopped because the femtosecond laser cannot have an eye tracker and you cannot f actually find where is your visual axis exactly. So the outcome is not always guaranteed. Conductive keratoplasty, this is another um, uh, uncommon procedure, but it is a promising one. You can, it depends on shrinking the collagen of the cornea, and just like the, uh, the shape here, it creates a hyperprolate cornea. Again, it creates a belt around the cornea with shrinking the collagen. How do they shrink the collagen? You have two ways. Either with an electric probe, you go up to 450 microns, as you see here, or with um, YAG laser, um, um, holmium YAG laser that can uh, hit the cornea. Unfortunately, it is not a stable procedure and the outcome is good for the first two or three years, but then it regresses um, poorly. Corneal inlays. We in the market, we already have now three corneal inlays, but actually only one of them is here in Saudi Arabia. This is the first one, the FlexiView, and this is still under trials. It is very thin. It is a multifocal inlay, which means it has a power. It has a power in the middle and at the periphery, but the center, it has a, a small hole to improve... No? Uh, the center has a small hole to improve the uh, corneal uh, biometric and fluidics. It is... It comes in different powers as well, and this is how it looks like under the slit lamp. It's very um, nice cosmetically, but centration is very essential here because a little bit of this centration can bring dramatic, devastating results. It's still under studies, as I mentioned. The raindrop, this is another beautiful um, inlay, and it works without any power. What it actually does, it is, pr it is placed under a flap about three, um, 300, uh, 160 microns, and uh, it only changes the shape of the cornea to a hyperprolate cornea. So it has to be placed in the center and covered by the uh, LASIK, by the uh, femto flap. Um, it, it is cosmetically nice and does not cause any dimming because of its transparent color. It is very safe because it's mostly made of water. 
this is how it is, looks like, how small it is, and this is what cornea topography would look like after a raindrop, more like a keratoconic stable case with no posterior elevation. And it is unfortunately only good for those who are very low hyperope, like 0.75 or 0.5 only. Here's a video of how you can put it, but I'm going to forward it. This is the flap created. And when the surgeon brings the raindrop, he actually places the raindrop in the center of the visual axis flatly. I allow the inlay to dry for approximately 60 seconds until it has the appearance of an orange peel or golf ball. In other words, as it dries, it dimples on its surface. Then you know it's fixed in place. I maintain hydration on both the epithelial and stromal side of the flap and around the inlay during this drying time. The drying time is longer than a typical LASIK and you don't want the stroma and the flap to dry out. I find hydrating the periphery of the stromal bed removes foreign debris and helps in repositioning the flap for rapid visual recovery without stria. Where the stromal bed and inlay. You cannot see it anymore. It's just there, but I you cannot see it. I check to make sure the flap is appropriately positioned. So this is, I think, is going to take a very good chance in the market. The camera inlay, that is the one we have in Saudi Arabia, and it is already FDA approved, is also very fascinating. It is very thin. It's only five microns thick. And it has a central aperture of 1.6. That is the desired pupil size you want for extended depth of focus. It has fenestrations to keep the fluidics of the eye running with um, uh, very minimum uh, corneal haze or scar. But it should be placed deep. It should be about uh, 300 microns in depth. And if you're combining it with a LASIK flap or LASIK surgery, you should calculate to have at least 100 micron difference between the residual stroma and the depth of your camera inlay. And this is how it works again. The target of camera are patients with presbyopia, emmetropa, hypermetropia, or myopia. Before putting your camera inlay, you have to aim to keep it only on the non-dominant eye with a minus 0.75. Now, one would question, if I am keeping this eye already with a 0.75 diopter minus, then am I not keeping this eye myope? How would this camera work? Actually, minus 0.75 wouldn't help a lot for reading, but it actually helps to give you this last images clear without changing anything in your distant visual acuity. And since you're putting it only on one eye, it is not going to play with the stereopsis at all because the difference is tolerable between both eyes. It is uh, reversible if you don't like it, and it does not obscure any, um, uh, does not prevent you from doing cataract surgery while creating this. Now the LASIK flap, uh, sorry, before taking your patient for camera inlay, it ha he has to go under a specific uh, investigation, namely using this um, um, uh, machine that is the acute target machine. It measures the tear stability and it measures the lenticular um, uh, and it measures also the lenticular scatter. I will run fast here. This is the scleral-based surgery. That is the scatter's theory. And that's, um, it is already abandoned. It's not done. The scatter's theory is based on, uh, again, increasing the space between the ciliary muscle and the iris, where you have to push away the uh, sclera. They put four PMMA implants, trying to increase the space. But this surgery is abandoned, and it's not used anymore. The la other laser um, scleral-based surgery is the uh, laser scleral matrix mi micro-incision. This is very new, and it uses laser beam. You create multiple um, holes on the sclera, and the aim here is to make the sclera more elastic and pliable for the ciliary muscle to contract it. Lens-based surgeries. Again, you can have do this, and this is our fascinating part. Either monovision, accommodating IOL, or multifocal IOL. And the multifocals can be either refractive or diffractive. It was in, uh, early when uh, Dr. Uh, Bosaka visualized a patient with aniridia. What actually happens when you accommodate? The iris and the lens are pushed forward with accommodation, and thereby he knew that this is the true about the Helmholtz theory. Silicon IOL plate haptic were introduced in the 1980s, and the doctors noticed that patients with silicon IOL can incredibly near read very well, even without spectacles. Why is that done? They found out that this lens has a pliable um, uh, effort, and it can be pushed forward or bent forward. The accommodating IOLs 
have a, there are either single haptic, dual haptic, or they can change in curvature, and they all give one focal point. The common ones are the Iconics, Tetraflex, and Human Optics, and they all have hinged haptics. When placed in the eye, it should be flat. When the patient is not accommodating, it is bent forward, downward, and when the patient accommodates, it bends forward. Now, this is the commonest one of them. It is ideal for um, uh, middle-aged patients. It is excellent for distance, good for, uh, for intermediate, and less perfection for near. Most of them will need reading glasses, so you don't get rid of your glasses with crystallines. It is not recommended for young patients or myopics who are happy to read without glasses. Um, I'm going to skip this. The Synchrony IOL. This is another very nice IOL that is actually very smart. It, is, it resembles your, your lens, your normal lens. It has an upper optic and a lower optic. One, the upper optic is always plus 32, and the back optic is minus, six, uh, minus 4 to minus 16, adjusted according to your IOL power. This bulky lens is supposed to fill in the bag and sit inside and does not allow the anterior and posterior capsule to touch. It keeps them always open. Thereby, when you, uh, when you accommodate, it is pushed downward and upward according uh, to your needs. This is how it looks like in the, ciliary, uh, in the uh, lens bag and in the eye. It can give up to 2.5 diopters of accommodation per one millimeter of, uh, of flexion. It is still under studies, but inshallah, it will come to the market soon. I'm going to skip also this video because it will take some time. The future IOLs are this fluid vision lenses and the smart IOL. I will start with the smart IOL, which is a lens that is, when it comes to you in the theater, it is a rod, a thick, hard rod. Once you put it inside the eye, with the temperature of the eye, it flexes down and it attains the exact lens shape. This is supposed to fill your uh, lenticular bag and it accommodates and converges and diverges, uh, sorry, and uh, flexes and bends according to the accommodating need. This is also still under studies. The f this kind of uh, fluid vision lens, in this chamber, this is the haptic. The haptic is uh, filled with fluid, but it has a channel opening to the optical part. When you squeeze or when we accommodate, the ciliary muscle will push the haptics inwards, forcing the fluid to go into the optic and bulging the, the uh, uh, anterior part or lenticular part. And when you are not accommodating, the fluid goes back to its normal place and you go back to our emetropic uh, vision. This is a very smart lens, and, but it's still bulky. This is only custom-made, new lens. It's an Israeli lens. And it's, this lens is not based in the uh, bag. This is based in the sulcus. And it's custom made for those with very high um, uh, visual demands and low vision aids, but still under trials. The fascinating other uh, light, uh, lens is the light adjustable lens. This is now about to be pop, um, in the market. The light adjustable lens is a silicone lens with multiple columns inside. What happens is they do, you, they do the regular refractive, uh, sorry, the regular FACO and the lens is implanted. Two weeks later, they check the patient's refractive error. If the patient is myopic, they will put this UV light on the, on the light adjustable lens for a few minutes with a certain energy, changing the, uh, the location of polymerized lens. Uh, polymerized polymers. So these co polymers in the lens will become polymerized and they will shrink. Once they shrink, they will change the gradient and force the non-polymerized to move in. And this is how the lens would look like. You can treat hyperopia, myopia, and um, make the patient more myopic for monovision if you require it. The refractive versus diffractive multifocal. Now, I have this very nice video. I, I started late, so I think I can get 15 minutes late. <laughs> 15 minutes more. I want you to see this. Can you raise the volume? Directing light to the retina related to the principles of refractive. To understand the difference between diffractive and refractive. Light. So this is a diffractive IOL. Just like water waves, light waves collide with each other. There are different ways waves can meet or interact. They can meet peak to peak or, or trough, trough to trough. trough to provide. Okay, and this is what I wanted you to see here. A refractive lens 
actually has multiple optical zones, minus, plus, minus, plus, and changing up on and giving multiple uh, focal points, as you see here. And we only have the resume and uh, oculentis that are refractive. The beauty about refractive lens is it does not lose light energy. The diffractive IOL has a different principle. It only gives two focal points because this kind of surface of the lens will force the light to bend in a way, giving it a special amplitude with special amplitudes will go together and those with different amplitude will go to the other focal point, giving two district focal points. The area in between is the blur area and that's what we see and your brain can neglect upon according to what you are aiming to focus. If you want to increase the diopteric power of the ad for this multifocal lens, you actually have to increase these steps. So a plus 0.75 would only have these, a plus 3 will have more, and a plus 4 would have more. They also play with the shape of the steps to make the lens either less blurry or um, uh, more um, uh, without uh, halos and glare. This is what we call an apodized lens. An apodized lens has the steps gradually reduced to the periphery. This gradual reduction is aimed to keep more light energy within the eye. If you want to check the difference between refractive versus diffractive, a distance, for distance they are both equal. Refractive IOLs have better intermediate vision. Near vision is better with a diffractive IOL. The pupil dependence, diffractive lenses are less dependent on pupil, and the light energy loss is more with the diffractive. Glare and halos are more with the diffractive lenses. When I compare between them, it's like comparing between these. This, the, the subtle changes between the IOL makes it really difficult for me to choose between the lenses. Refractive lens IOLs are the resume and the oculentis and the diffractive in the Saudi market, I did not mention everywhere else, is the Technus, Fine Vision, Physiol, Atelisa, and Restore Panoptics. The Physiol, this is one of the very first IOLs presented. F stands for far, I intermediate, and near is for, and for near. It comes in two different shapes. Basically, uh, the only difference between them is the diopteric power, otherwise they are both very stable in the eye. It's all hydrophilic acrylic, diffractive, with a uh, posterior square edge to prevent PCOs. The refractive other uh, IOL is the oculentis. The oculentis is an asymmetrical lens, which means there is no power superior and inferior equal. Upper is for distance and lower is a gradual near add. It works by giving this shape of lens. This is, uh, it has only two, either the Comfort or the M+, and it actually also acts by giving two refractive uh, focal points. It can come in uh, with cylinder as well. This beauty about this lens is even if you place it upside down, it will still function because anything behind the pupil will reach to the macula in the same quality, no matter, it's not like you're reading glasses. It's actually some surgeons put it upside down intentionally to reduce the glare during driving. The Zayas trifocal lens is another diffractive IOL and it is one of the commonest here in Riyadh. Uh, it can come in ads from between plus 3 to plus 1.6. It also comes with toric and the beauty about the toric with this, eye, with this lens, it can come up to 12 diopters and I have used quite high numbers with this. Um, the Technus AMO is not, I did not use it in Saudi Arabia but I know it is available. The Restore family, Restore itself is bifocal. But the new one is the uh, pan optics. The pan optics is a multi um, is a multifocal lens. The difference between them is the multifocal lens does not depend a lot on light. It is better for intermediate vision, and it is non-apodized. I have placed these IOLs to all together to make it easy for all of us. Who is diffractive and who is refractive, and who is hydrophilic, and hydrophobic? The only hydrophobic is the pan optics. Um, most of them have a very smooth surface to reduce the glare and halo. With the uh, oculentis, there should be no glare and halo because there is no, no, um, no crescents there. And uh, with the um, add, all of them have almost equal adds. 3.5, 3.3, 3.3, 3.25. The only difference would be a little bit within the intermediate zone. Um, and it is very subtle to, ch uh, to notice. Who is pupil dependent and who is not? Most of them are pupil independent. However, um, the pan optics is more physiologically functions and it still needs a little bit of uh, small pupil to work. Be uh, regarding the light energy, the, the difference between them is very minimum. 
they all conserve light, but the lentils does not uh, lose any light because it does not have any um, scattering. For intermediate vision, the Zayas is good between 60 and 80, along with the physiol, but for the panoptics, it's 60 centimeters. The, pan the lentils can come from 35 to 60, according to your uh, power desired. The premium very lenses are very subtle changes. You might not notice any significance between them, but the key here is the careful patient selection. This is the future of the uh, presbyopia treatment, lens filling or femtosecond laser with uh, photo disruption, or the lens regeneration with the stem cells. I can show you some of my challenging cases that I have done. Um, I have done a, a big number. That is because it is a little bit difficult to bring this high facility to a government, government hospital because of the expenses. And because I have a very high selection uh, criteria, I do not offer this to everyone. Um, only 22 patients uh, I was able to retrieve, uh, 36 eyes. Uh, eight of them were unilateral. 13 eyes had tritoric lenses, and 23 had trifocal only. 55% of them had 6-6 visual acuity, but 41 of them had 6-10 or better, and they all did not need any driving or uh, distant uh, eyeglasses. One patient had 6-18 with a PCO that I will do, inshallah, in the future. The near visual acuity I achieved in 33 centimeters, 75% had J2 or better, 25% had J5 or better, and only pa four patients had J6. The intermediate vision um, at 60 centimeters, eight patients had J1 and 28 patients had J6 or better. Yak capsulotomy was done about 30% of my cases. No one of them needed the spectacle, uh, spectacles for distance. Two patients asked for occasional reading glasses and no one complained of glare or harrow for more than two months. I will not show you how to put the lens. I will actually show you how to remove the lens. Now in my cases, I had to remove four of them. And uh, the key here um, is to have good instruments. You need to have an intraocular forceps and preferably a curved one. I was using here a straight one and it was difficult. You do not have to cut the lens um, horizontally. You have to cut it longitudinally. If you cut it horizontally, you will struggle with the pieces jumping all around. But cut it longitudinally, it is easy to remove. Once you, uh, it is very soft. It, even after seven months in the bag, it does not adhere to the capsular bag, so you should not have any problems in um, detaching it from the um, capsular bag. This is how it's done. And you cut the other half, simply, and pull it, each half alone. Now, the four cases that I had to remove um, two of them were um, my first, very first initial cases because I had the haptic cut and it was pushed in the eye. The patient was not happy because they were toric, so I had to change them, but I changed them to another Zayas lens. I did not change um, to another IOL. And uh, this specific patient, um, he's, a, he's a friend of my father and he was doing very well during the surgery. Only, and this was a toric multifocal lens, at the moment that I was telling him, I'm going to put your lens inside the eye, he was excited. He squeezed a little bit and pop the capsule, capsule just popped out and I had vitreous loss. Now I had two options, either to put this lens or to put a monofocal lens. He was waiting for this multifocal lens and I thought that I will give it a try even to keep it in the sulcus. So I placed it in the sulcus, but unfortunately on the second day, I saw it decentered inferiorly in a way that his pupil would never be able to gain any part of the clear zone. Uh, a week later, I brought him in and I explanted it and placed for him a monofocal three-piece lens. So the message here is do not put it in the sulcus. It will not work very well. This is one of my challenging cases. It's, she's a doctor and uh, she had formed Fust Keratoconus. She was 52 years old and concerned about her uh, cosmetic appearance. She refused to wear glasses by all means and she was not happy about what to do. She was one of the very first cases that I um, ordered for her a multifocal trifocal uh, lens with, a, with a, an axis. She's now 6'6 for distance, happier than when she was before with J1 reading at all distances. Another young girl who's 26 years old, and this is the last case, Dr. Gahtani, she, had, this, she came to me with, she's 26, 3.5 and plus 1.5, and this is her visual acuity. With cyclo, there wasn't much difference. I was not happy about this four and a half diopters of astigmatism, and I was wondering, how can I treat this girl? Um, it has a very slight amblyopia. 
I don't often do hyperopic uh, refra um, refractive surgery, so I offered her to do only one eye clear lens extraction. I just saw her a few days ago. She's 6, 7.5 for distance. That's what she had before. J3 for near and J3 for intermediate. She was very happy and she does not want any more surgeries, not even for her other eye. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Saati, for this comprehensive, informative presentation. Five minutes for any comments or questions. Dr. Saleh. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ali. You did a very good uh, job in presenting a very difficult subject. Now, uh, as you mentioned in the first slides, it is a dynamic process. And most of our treatment, they are more of static ones and trying to get it along. Uh, now, uh, the thing that also uh, I want to stress is patient selection. I have even, but this is, we cannot do it in a Russian clinic. I think you need more chair time with patients, yes. especially in private. This is very important. You can uh, see the personality, you can see how the, uh, bad they are for these lenses. And I explained a few lenses just came from uh, sort of other facilities that they would just from, if they spend more chair time, they will not put any of these premium IOs. Now the other point is that classic teaching for premium eye oils that do it for both eyes. Mm -hmm. In fact, I have few patients, I did it for one eye, they are very happy, Absolutely. glasses independent, no uh, problems with uh, uh, night problems. Absolutely. Uh, what, what do you, what's your... Yes, um, I agree, I totally agree with you. I had um, a few patients who came to me who were pseudophagic already in the first eye, and they were asking to do the other eye, how can I help without eyeglasses? So I sit with them enough time and I tell them that I'm going to try with you the multifocal. This is a lens that it might work and might not work. But please, if you are the type of patient that compares with your both eyes all the time, this is not going to be suitable at all. So I make sure that they are the, pers the fit personality and not the very demanding ones. And their aim is really to get rid of the glasses. And that's what I mentioned in my uh, cases. They want to get rid of their glasses. If they don't want to get rid of their glasses, then you w they will not be happy. Yes, yeah, Dr. Said, Fadal. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Saati, for a very informative lecture. Actually, it's really challenging uh, subject, which, um, as you mentioned, 100% uh, for the future of most of the people. And as you know, surgery will depend either corneal surgery or after cataract surgery. Those which you uh, did with the corneal, how do you do the calculation later on, regardless either uh, camera or uh, uh, whatever type you mean of the IOL calculation? Later on, yes. Um, Alhamdulillah, I haven't faced this yet. <laughs> I'm sure my seniors have done this more, more than I did. But I know for sure that there are special formulas um, for them. But I did not encounter it. Maybe you can take Dr. Kirat's opinion, who is our IOL uh, calculator master <laughs> since residency. I have not encountered it, but I know that uh, there are special um, uh, formulas for them. Yeah, definitely, there is special. I'm asking this question I to don't know them. make people aware of it. Yeah. Otherwise, we know these things will face, because like LASIK in the beginning, when we start LASIK, then later on patient need uh, uh, calculation for the mm -hmm. uh, cataract surgery, we face difficulty of with course. the later master and other uh, formulas. We found it easy to uh, implant. And um, the other uh, important message is the how to uh, uh, educate your patient. And this is the most important for yes. all types because the demand of patient is different from patient to other patient. Some patients, they have very excellent uh, result, but they never convinced. Sorry. And they will push you, push you to either remove the lens but or do this yes. thing. So to take uh, just a few minutes before surgery is important. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Last comment or question by Dr. Omar? Yeah, just a comment about corneal, corneal-based uh, breast biopsy treatment. Um, it was really a very good lecture, but it, uh, nothing less actually. Uh, but you mentioned that uh, the cornea-based is reversible. You know, I don't think that any in any mean, whenever someone touches the cornea, it is reversible. Even if a flap is made and then 
the any any inlay placed under a flap, it will affect the curvature of the cornea, and even without a f inlay, the cornea will be affected. Just by touching the cornea, you will affect induce aberrations. You may induce other changes in the cornea, and topography will show that. Do a flap, remove whatever you want. Compare the topography, things will be uh, there will be differences. The other thing is, as my colleagues stressed and as you stressed, actually, it's how the much how much the patient is willing to trade off the uh, bad income or the slight, you know, aberrations. How willing the patient is to accept. So I think it's lens based. The question is: Is there any way of mimicking the multifocal vision, but for example, by a contact lens? You mentioned the, the multifocal contact lens. Will yeah. it mimic the multifocal yes. lens? Uh, yeah, and yeah, it would be like 80% similar to it because I've done this in several times when I started my multifocal surgeries. I used to send them to my colleague, Dr. Abassima. If she's here, I'm not, I'm not sure. But I used to send them to her and make sure that she fits them as multifocals and let the patient try them on and see how much they tolerate. If they tolerate it, I know that they are going to be fit for it. But right now, actually, I'm not so uh, enthusiastic about doing it. I'm more confident with my uh, selection and I, I can tell which patients will be able to uh, tolerate it and which will not. So far, alhamdulillah, I never had to remove any of them and replace it with another uh, type of IOL. They were all replaced with the same, those who were replaced with the same, uh, same IOL, same the, material. The, the IOL, the contact lens may, but you know, with the movement, it may give a lot of Yes, I told uh, the patient. Abnormal, uh, you know, uh, abnormal jump. information. Yeah. Image jump, the, yes. The contact lens will keep moving. It may not be similar to the lens inside the eye, but Yes, but again, don't uh, forget that you have two types of patients, I, either the ones with cataract or ones with a clear lens extraction. Those with cataract will be happy whatever you give them. But those with clear lens extraction are the ones that are difficult to, uh, to convince. Those with le clear lens extraction, I, do, I have two categories of patients, either high myopes or hyperopes. The hyperopes are always easy. I have no problems with them. The myopes, I sit with them for at least one or two sessions telling them that you will not be able to read that close. You have to read an a normal distance of 30 to 40 centimeters. Do not try to go to your normal habit on bringing your objects back to your eye because this is going to um, devastate you. In fact, I had one patient, one of the ones who was explanted. He was minus seven. And uh, the very first day post-op, he, he came to me with a minus nine. And I was so uh, surprised with this uh, uh, devastating result, only to figure out that there was a miscalculation of one millimeter uh, in the axial length between two machines, and it was giving uh, to the company the wrong machine. In fact, the patient was very happy. He had congenit um, a little bit of uh, blue dot cataract, and he said, please correct the other eye just like this one. I said, how can I correct it? He said, just key I want to see that close, and I want to be uh, able to see clearly. He found it clearer than his blue dot cataract with all this glare and halo. Of course, I didn't do this. I had to convince him again and put him in metropic, and the other eye will be done in shore, inshallah. Thank you very much. Very quick, please. Uh, sort of expandly, and make sure if you are using it in diabetics, never do argon laser treatment through the, uh, with the camera inlay in place because you will burn the cornea. And this has been reported. Also, uh, vitro retinal surgery can be done through the parallax of the camera as well. 